Hi, everyone. Welcome to the C3 AI DTI seminar series. My name is Richard Zhang. I am an assistant professor at the University of Illinois. Uh, I am co-organizing and co-hosting the semester's seminar series with Gary Joshi at CMU, who is also today's speaker. Uh, C3 AI DTI features research that focuses on studying how artificial intelligence, machine learning, and big data can lead to scientific breakthroughs with large-scale societal benefits. Uh, and before we begin, we would like to pause to acknowledge the support from our academic and industry partners, for which we are deeply grateful. Now, the Fall 2022 series is organized around uh, two special themes, adversarial machine learning and distributed and federated learning. Our talks are scheduled to alternate between these two themes over alternating weeks. Uh, the semester is wrapping up. We have the remaining three speakers lined up for the next few weeks. Today we'll be hearing from Gary Joshi from CMU after Thanksgiving. Uh, I will be presenting as Si Woon Oh from the University of Washington will be speaking in our final week. Um, uh, our series has had many exciting speakers over the semester. Uh, the videos of previous talks, both from the current series as well as past series, are uh, available on our YouTube channel. We invite you to subscribe to our newsletters and our channel so that you don't miss these talks. So today we're very excited to welcome Professor Gary Joshi to share her research with a talk entitled Tackling Computational and Data Heterogeneity in Federated Learning. Uh, Gary Joshi is an associate professor in the ECE department at Carnegie Mellon University. She completed her PhD from MIT EECS and completed her undergraduate degree in electrical engineering from IIT Bombay. Her current research is on designing algorithms for federated learning, distributed optimization, and parallel computing. Her awards and honors include being named as one of MIT Technology Review's 35 innovators under 35, in 2022, the NSF Career Award in 2021, the ACM Sigmetrics Best Paper Award in 2020, Best Thesis Prize in Computer Science at MIT in 2012, and the Institute Gold Medal of IIT Bombay in 2010. So the format of this presentation will be 15 minutes, uh, followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. Uh, for the audience, please use the Q&A feature to submit your questions, and we'll ask them on your behalf at the end of the talk. Uh, without further ado, let's welcome Professor Gary Joshi um, for her very exciting talk. Whenever you're ready, Gary. Thank you so much, Richard, for the introduction. Uh, let me share my slides and then get started. Uh, can you see my slides and hear me? Yes, Hi. yes. Hi, so let me start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to present my group's work on tackling heterogeneity in federated optimization. Uh, today, I'm going to cover snippets of several different works, which are joint research conducted along with my students who are listed here, uh, as well as other collaborators who are part of ongoing research. Um, and I'll mention some of that ongoing research um, in towards the end of my talk. So this talk is about federated optimization or federated learning. Um, but when I say designing algorithms for federated learning, what I really mean is designing SGD or stochastic gradient descent algorithms. And that's because as you all might know, uh, machine learning training today is synonymous with using SGD. It's the most commonly used optimization algorithm. Um, at its core, uh, SGD is very simple. Uh, it involves uh, minimizing an objective function, which takes this form of the empirical risk function, that is the average of the individual losses over the points in the training data set. And in each iteration, we sample a mini batch out of the data set, uh, compute gradients uh, of the uh, points in that mini batch, and then update the parameter vector x using this equation for some learning rate uh, eta. So as you can see from this equation, uh, SGD is inherently a sequential algorithm. Uh, and for large data sets, running this sequentially at a single node can be prohibitively slow. Uh, so in most 
standard implementations, we always distribute the computation of gradients and the update of the parameter vector across multiple computing nodes. So this is the standard way in which um, SGD is implemented in the data center setting, where the task of computing gradients uh, is split between several workers. So the way uh, it works is that you have a central parameter server, and then you have, say, M workers, each storing different partitions of the training data set. And in each iteration, these, these workers will read the current version of the model from the parameter server. Then they will compute gradients or using a mini batch drawn from their local data partition. And then these gradients will be aggregated by the parameter server to update the model parameter vector X. And this process repeats uh, after every iteration. So from this um, architecture, one thing that we may notice is that as you increase the number of workers, we have more parallelism in the system. So we expect to process the data set uh, at a much faster rate. But this doesn't lead to a speed up that is just proportional to the number of worker nodes. And that's because there can be synchronization delays in waiting for slow workers to finish their computation or communication delays on these links, uh, et cetera. So hurdles like this hamper the scalability of this parameter server framework. And over the years, there has been extensive research on improving the scalability using methods such as doing asynchronous aggregation or infrequent communication with local update SGD or overlapping communication and computation. So uh, my group uh, has also contributed to some of this research, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, so although there have been all these works to improve the scalability of the parameter server framework, uh, it still has some uh, fundamental limitations. So one of the limitations is that all these workers are typically assumed to be homogeneous and available throughout the training process. And more importantly, this paradigm itself assumes that there is a centrally available data set uh, that can be shuffled and then evenly partitioned across these worker nodes. And these assumptions break down in many modern applications where massive amounts of informative training data is collected by edge devices, such as cell phones, tablets, sensors, et cetera. Uh, an example of um, such applications is the next word prediction application, which we use on our smartphones, where language models are used to learn from what users type on their phones in order to predict the next word that they would type. Um, and in order to train these models, uh, if we use the parameter server framework, which I introduced on the previous slide, then we would have to send all the training data from thousands of these edge devices over to the cloud, and then the training would happen in the cloud. But because these devices are resource limited and bandwidth limited, such data transfer can be expensive and slow. And moreover, there also be, be privacy laws that, for, that forbid data sharing with foreign cloud servers. So this is where federated learning comes in. In order to operate within these communication and privacy constraints, um, federated learning has emerged as a new paradigm over the past few years. Uh, the core idea of federated learning is that data stays on the edge device. And instead, we shift model training from the cloud to the edge. So in each round of training, these edge clients will perform a few local steps of training um, using their own data. And then only the resulting models are shared with the central server. The data never leaves that device. And by doing this, by doing this uh, local training and only sharing the models with the cloud server, we get better communication efficiency as well as better privacy guarantees than just sending all the data. So this is at a high level uh, what federated learning is and how it addresses some of the issues with data center-based training. 
So now that all of you have a high level idea, let me um, define more concretely the notation that I will use for the rest of the talk. So I'll define the objective functions that are involved and the basic optimization algorithm. Um, so consider that you have a system of M edge devices um, and these edge devices have different uh, local data set that they collect from the environment. So these are not partitions of a centrally available data set, but rather they are generated at the device itself. So these data sets, they will induce some local objective functions at the edge devices. So fi is the objective function at the ith device or the ith client, and it is um, the average of the per sample losses over the data set at that client. And then the global objective function is a weighted average of these local objectives. This weighted average is typically taken in proportion of the data set sizes. So the PI here is equal to the fraction of data that is there at the ith client. And the reason why the PI is chosen in this way is to emulate cloud-based training where hypothetically, if all these data had been sent to the cloud, then this would be the weight assigned to the data of the ith client. So these PIs can be also chosen in other ways, but um, for, for now, let's assume that this is proportional to the fraction of the data, side, uh, data set size at the ith client. So the goal of federated learning uh, is that we want to find a common model X that minimizes this global objective function F of X. Uh, the, there are variants of this goal uh, that are studied in the literature. For example, you could consider personalized federated learning where we don't have a single global model. Um, or you could try to introduce fairness across the different devices and consider other aspects like that. But for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus on this objective where we want to train a single global model that minimizes f of x. So that's the objective functions and the notation. Uh, now let me introduce the basic algorithm, which is called Fed averaging. So this algorithm is the uh, most standard implementation of federated learning that's currently used. Uh, what it does is that instead of sharing the raw data with the server, uh, each client device does tau local SGD updates. So the algorithm is divided into communication rounds where in each round, uh, the current model is sent to the edge devices, uh, whichever are, are available at that time. Then these edge clients, they do tau local steps of SGD each and their resulting models, which may be different from each other because the local data sets can be different from each other. Uh, these resulting models are then sent back to the cloud server, which aggregates them and updates the global model. And the aggregation is done using this equation where you just average the models in proportion of PIs, which are the data set fractions at the different clients. So that is the federated averaging algorithm. And the goal of my talk today is to understand how this algorithm uh, is affected by heterogeneity in the system. So what do I mean by heterogeneity? Uh, there can be actually several sources of heterogeneity in federated learning. So let's talk about where heterogeneity comes from. Uh, the first source, uh, which many people might be familiar with already if they have read about federated learning, is data heterogeneity. So as we discussed, unlike the data center setting, here the data sets, um, the local data sets are collected by the clients themselves. So because of that, these objective functions F1 through FM can be very different from each other. And as these clients do local SGD updates, their resulting models will also be very different from each other. So uh, as you do more and more local steps at these clients, because of the divergence between these models, uh, it can lead to 
a slowdown uh, or some convergence problems when, when it comes to the convergence of the global model. Uh, so as we'll see later on, um, as uh, with increasing T, the um, convergence of the global model is affected and we'll quantify how that happens. So that is the first source of heterogeneity. The second source of heterogeneity in federated learning is communication heterogeneity. So in a typical FL framework, there can be thousands of these edge clients. And um, in order for the clients to do training, uh, generally they have to have enough battery uh, or they need to be plugged in for charging. So not all of them are available at any given uh, communication round and their availability can also vary across different time zones because these can be distributed in different parts of the world. So it is impractical to assume that all of these M clients will be available and therefore most algorithms consider that there is partial client participation. That is out of the M clients only some fraction C is available uh, at any given round, and only these available CM clients are used to perform uh, the local updates. So these available clients do the local updates and their modules are aggregated by the cloud server, whereas all the other clients, they don't participate in this given round. So uh, partial client participation like this, exacerbates the effect of data heterogeneity on the performance of the federated averaging algorithm. And in this talk, we'll see how we can tackle this source of heterogeneity by choosing the clients more carefully and uh, processing the, their updates in a better manner. Finally, the third source of heterogeneity is computational heterogeneity. So these edge devices, uh, inherently may have different computation speeds or memory limitations. So instead of forcing all of uh, the devices to do the same number of local updates, uh, we can allow the flexibility to, for, uh, to faster devices to do more local updates and slower devices to do less local updates. And this uh, uh, heterogeneity in the local computation can compound the adverse effect of data and communication heterogeneity. So besides doing different numbers of local updates, the clients may also use different local uh, hyperparameters or different local optimizers. And this may also lead to computational heterogeneity, even in the case where the number of local updates is the same across the clients. So that's the overview of the sources of heterogeneity. Now let's go through these one by one and try to understand how they affect the underlying Fed averaging algorithm. So in this talk, we'll first try to show some analysis for each of these um, heterogeneity sources and then design strategies to tackle them uh, without slowing down the convergence of the global model. So let's talk about data heterogeneity first. Uh, and let's look at a toy example with just two clients to understand what exactly is this problem of data heterogeneity. So I'm going to consider two extreme cases. One is where uh, the two clients just do one local update and the other extreme case is where they do a large number of local updates. So let's consider these as the local minima and the global minima. So X1 star is the local minimum uh, of the first client. X, X2 star is the local minimum of the second client. And X star is the global minimum, which minimizes F of X, the global objective function. Uh, and because of data heterogeneity, you can see that these are different from each other. XT here shows the current version of the global model. Now in each round of federated learning, we will um, take a local step along uh, each client's local objective function. And then 
average these local steps to get the global gradient, which is shown by this dotted line. And what we can see here is that the global gradient, this dotted line, is actually um, proportional to the full gradient, uh, as if we had uh, we were just doing mini batch gradient descent. So because the uh, global gradient is consistent with the global objective function, uh, we can show that the global model will indeed eventually converge to the global optimum X star, uh, or if there is no global optimum, it will converge to a stationary point of uh, the objective function. However, this is not true in the large tau case. So here, if now the um, clients do a large number of local steps, so they'll start from the global model and do many local updates, then the first client will come close to its own local minimum. The second client will come close to its own local minimum. And when we take an average of these, we end up here. <clears throat> but now in the next communication round, they will go back again to their own local minimum and then we'll get just get stuck at this point when we average the subsequent local updated models. So the problem here is that the model converges to the average of the local minima, which may not match with the true optimum X star that we want to reach. And this problem uh, leads to the gap between this converged global model and X star, which is often referred to as the client drift error. So more formally, if we analyze the convergence uh, of federated averaging as a function of tau, the number of local updates, then we can show a convergence bound as follows. So assuming that there is some bounded gradient dissimilarity between the client, so this is measuring the amount of data heterogeneity in the system uh, in terms of the gradients of the local objective function and the global objective function. Uh, so assuming this kind of bounded dissimilarity, uh, the error which is shown on the left-hand side here can be bounded as uh, given by these three terms. The first two terms in this uh, expression mainly come from performing mini batch SGD. So it comes from the stochastic noise in the local updates. The third term is what is the client drift error that I was illustrating on the previous slide. So this term, as you can see, it increases with the amount of data heterogeneity, which is denoted by sigma g square here. And it also increases with tau, which is the number of local steps. So as you do more and more local steps, and if there's more heterogeneity in the system, this error bound becomes worse. So in recent literature, there have been several approaches that are proposed to mitigate this client drift error term. Um, I'll just review some of these approaches. So one approach is to set a small value of tau and or a small value of the learning rate eta, and this will limit how much a local model can move away from the global model and then mitigate this client drift error. However, this can lead to a slowdown in convergence because you're just making slower progress locally. Uh, another approach we have, which we proposed in uh, one of our works a few years ago was to adapt the number of local updates over rounds uh, such that at the beginning we uh, do more local updates, whereas as we come closer to convergence, we do less local updates. So this tries to mitigate client drift without uh, giving a convergence slowdown. Uh, some other approaches that are proposed in literature include adding a correction term. So these uh, require some additional communication or coordination between the clients. But what they do is that they ensure that these models that drift away as you do more and more local updates are corrected by pulling them back towards the global model and trying to ensure that the global gradient that we get is consistent with the global objective function. So these methods do work well at reducing client 
drift error, but then you incur some additional communication and computation cost. Mm -hmm. So overall, this problem of data heterogeneity can be addressed by uh, using one or more of these methods. However, there are still some interesting open questions uh, that are left for future works to address. So one of the open questions is that uh, this grading dissimilarity assumption that is made in client drift um, analysis seems to be too pessimistic. And that is because uh, if you don't use any of these client drift mitigation uh, techniques, even then federated averaging in practice seems to perform pretty well. Uh, in fact, it outperforms just regular SGD where you would do one local update per client. So it's a bit of a mystery because the theory suggests that uh, federated averaging should do worse as the uh, value of tau increases, but in practice it seems to do well. So in uh, one of our ongoing works, we are trying to address this by defining a different measure of data heterogeneity that may be uh, more matching with practice. Uh, but I'm not going to go into that today. Uh, if you're interested, please take a look at this work. I'll add a link to that at the end of the talk. Another open question is that if we look at this bound that I showed a couple of slides ago, uh, uh, it raises the question that is client drift error the real dominant term in this expression? So what we can see here is that if we set a small enough learning rate eta, then this term, uh, it has an eta square over there. So it decays faster than the other terms in the expression. And it actually is not the dominant term. And in fact, here until now, we have assumed that all the M clients participate in every round. However, if we consider partial participation of clients where only a fraction CM of the clients participate, then there will be another error term, which in fact dominates over this client drift error term. So as we'll see next, uh, that error term, because it dominates, uh, is what we'll try to focus on uh, rather than the client drift error term. And then by combining the techniques to mitigate both of these terms, we can reduce both the terms in the error. So that was about data heterogeneity. Now let me move on to communication heterogeneity. And then when I do that, I'll talk about how I get this additional error term and how to mitigate that. So in communication heterogeneity, as we discussed earlier, we consider that only a subset CM out of uh, the M clients will participate in any given round of training. So what we can show is that if we analyze the conversions of the federated averaging algorithm, then the error looks something like this. So the first two terms are the same as the previous bound. These come from stochastic noise in the local updates. Uh, the last term is the client drift error term, which we already saw. And this term is coming from the partial client participation. So C here is the fraction of clients that participate in any round. Um, and if C is equal to one, all that is all clients participate, then this term disappears. But if C is less than one, then you do get this additional error term which also increases with the amount of data heterogeneity, which is sigma g square. And if we compare the scalings of these terms, so here I'm showing the bound uh, for a constant learning rate eta, but if we choose this learning rate appropriately, then we can show that the different uh, terms um, decay at the rates shown in this bound where the client drift error uh, decays as one over T, where T is the number of communication rounds. Uh, whereas the partial client participation term decays as one over square root of T. So this decays much slower. And this is the dominant term in the error. So let us see how we can try to mitigate this term. The key idea that we will use in order to do that is that we will 
exploit correlation in the client updates across the different rounds. So the idea is that if a client, uh, say, participated in a round and it sent some update uh, to the uh, server, even if it does not participate in the next round, we can try to predict what update it would have sent because there is some strong temporal correlation between uh, the updates that a client sends in subsequent rounds of training. So to leverage this correlation, the idea that we propose in this work uh, called FedWarp, uh, which was published in UAI this year, is that uh, we maintain some memory at the server. So the server has um, a memory YI for each of the clients in the system. And then in the, in the memory, it stores the latest observed update from each client. So let's say these first two clients participate and then they send these updates. These are uh, stored in memory. And for the second, uh, the third and the fourth client, it's just zero. Now, if uh, these two clients participate in the next round, then the server memory is updated with their uh, updates delta three and delta four. So we'll keep on updating the server memory in this fashion as we go across different communication rounds. Uh, and now that we have this uh, information stored in memory, whenever a client does not participate, uh, we can use the value that is stored in memory in place of uh, its update. But if we just take a naive average of whatever is stored in memory and then uh, the latest observed updates of the participating clients, then we would get a biased estimate of the gradient. So instead, we need to do some kind of variance reduction in order to ensure that the overall update is an unbiased estimate of the full gradient, which we could have got if everybody participated. So the variance reduced update looks like this. So ST is the set of clients that participate in a round. Uh, for those clients, we'll sum up delta I minus the value in memory uh, and average that. And then we'll just take an average of uh, all the values that are stored in server memory. And then this variance reduced update is what is used to update the global model. So using this idea, we can show that we can in fact eliminate this partial client participation term and then we are only left with the other terms uh, that we would have got if all the clients had participated. So this was the main idea behind the fed warp work. Uh, now looking at this algorithm, one drawback that you may see already is that uh, doesn't this use a lot of server memory? Because for each single client, I'm storing something in the server memory. So can we reduce that cost? Uh, and it turns out we can. We can actually consider a clustered version of this algorithm where uh, we cluster clients and then we only maintain a single state per cluster. So even with this reduced memory version, uh, we observe that the algorithm does pretty well. So here are a couple of uh, result plots. The green and the red lines show the test accuracy of the clustered fed averaging fed warp and uh, the fed warp algorithms, and they outperform existing methods uh, such as fed averaging, scaffold, and MIFA, which is another uh, server memory based algorithm that was proposed in the literature. So we can see that uh, even with clustering and reduced memory. Uh, we get pretty good performance uh, that is comparable with the, just the original scheme that uh, considers server memory for each single client. So this was a brief overview of the work that helps us remove that partial client participation term. Um, now let me talk about uh, another recent work, which is on client selection. So, so far, we assume that uh, the set of clients that participate in a given round is chosen uniformly at random. And this assumption is done in most existing works in Fed averaging uh, in order to ensure that uh, 
the surrogate objective function that we end up optimizing when a subset of clients participate is an unbiased estimate of uh, the full objective function f of x. However, um, if you look at the global objective function uh, that is shown in this equation, we can see that clients which have large values of fi will dominate in this expression. So what if instead of just selecting clients uh, uniformly at random, we try to bias uh, the choice towards clients which have higher losses. So if we preferentially select clients which have higher current values of FI, we might be able to improve conversions. And here is a toy example to illustrate that. So if you do unbiased um, random selection of clients, then starting from a uh, point, uh, let's say you have just two clients and then we are selecting one client in every round. If we choose the second client, then we move downwards along the second ob local objective function. And then we, when we choose the first client, we switch to the first client's objective function. So we go back and forth between uh, optimizing either F1 or F2. And then this can lead to some cycle. So we can uh, go back and forth and oscillate. Uh, and it may take a long time to optimize the true objective function f of x, which is the global objective. Instead, if we always chose the client, which has a higher value, either f2 or f1, um, then we will reach much faster to the minimum of the uh, global objective function. So this is just a toy example to illustrate the idea, but uh, the high level thing is that we want to bias selection towards higher loss clients. Now the question is, will this also hurt conversion? So maybe it will converge faster, but what if you have some solution bias at the end? So we did some formal analysis of that by defining a metric called the selection skew of a client selection strategy. So I won't go into the math here. The row um, at a high level measures the skew of a selection strategy. So if rho is equal to one, we are doing unbiased selection. If rho is greater than one, then we are biasing towards higher loss clients. And if rho is less than one, we are biasing towards lower loss clients. So in the proposed work where we bias towards higher loss clients, uh, we can show that uh, we can get a faster convergence rate. So this is the convergence bound. Uh, this factor rho is in the denominator of the first term. So as you increase rho, we converge faster. However, it comes at the cost of some additional error term, uh, which also increases with rho and it also increases with the data heterogeneity, which here is denoted by gamma. So now let me describe the client selection strategy that we propose. So this is inspired by the power of D uh, choices strategy, which is used in load balancing. Um, so the idea is that um, we can first sample a candidate set of clients uh, and the size of this set is D. Then we estimate the losses uh, of those clients. That is for each of these candidate clients, we send the current version of the global model and ask them to send an estimate of the local objective function. So this can be a noisy estimate. Uh, it doesn't have to actually go through the entire local data set, uh, but as long as we get a um, rough estimate, we can order these clients in terms of their local losses and then select the CM clients that have the largest local losses. So by doing that, we are biasing towards the higher loss clients. And another thing to note here is that we have this free parameter D that can be used to tune how much that biases. So if you choose a larger value of D, that is if we have a bigger candidate set, uh, then we are being more biased by uh, selecting only CM clients out of a larger set of clients. On the other hand, if we just set D equal to CM, uh, then we uh, go back to 
unbiased client selection. So by tuning D, we can control the amount of bias. Now, this idea, although we proposed it in the context of client selection, is not new in uh, general for SGD training. In fact, it has been proposed earlier for mini batch SGD at a single node, where instead of choosing mini batches uh, uniformly at random with replacement, if we do these kind of um, loss aware mini batch selection strategies, then we can indeed improve convergence. So using this um, client selection strategy, uh, we can indeed show that we get faster conversion. So these plots show the global loss versus the communication rounds for the random selection, and then power of D choices for two, two different values of D. So as you increase D, uh, we get faster conversions. Uh, however, it does come at the cost of a slightly higher error floor. So you can see that at the end, uh, when we uh, reach closer um, to convergence, the bias schemes have a slightly higher error floor. So that uh, could be mitigated by adapting D over rounds. And we did try that, and that indeed uh, gets the best of both worlds, where it improves convergence, um, but also reaches a lower error floor. Another improvement that we can do to this strategy is to con construct some communication and computation variants of these, because the second step here could be expensive in practice. Um, so these variants, uh, let me show you some results that uh, compare these variants with uh, just the vanilla scheme and the random selection. Uh, so all of these variants of power of D choices gives better accuracy. Uh, better test accuracy and lower training loss. And interestingly, the gap between the random selection and these strategies increases as there is more data heterogeneity in the system. So what, the insight that we get from this is that if there is more data heterogeneity across clients, then these biased client selection strategies are even more effective. So summarizing, um, I proposed a loss-aware client selection strategy. Um, there are some interesting open questions. So can we do some simpler client selection, maybe not even loss-aware, if we just go round robin um, between the clients, uh, then can we still improve conversions? And initial results actually indicate, yes, we can improve conversions even with these other simpler client selection strategies. Another question is that uh, these strategies, in addition to improving conversions, can they also give other benefits such as fairness or robustness? Um, and initial results also indicate, yes, for example, the power of choice strategy uh, does improve fairness and it uh, improves the representation given to clients uh, which have less data and are in the minority in this um, system. So with that, let me go to the last part of my talk. I have like about 15 minutes left. Uh, I think I'll leave a few minutes for questions. So I'll go through this in about 10 minutes. Um, so we talked about data heterogeneity and communication heterogeneity. Uh, now let's go to computational heterogeneity, where the clients in the system can do different numbers of uh, local updates, and they may also use different uh, learning rates or local optimizers. So this form of heterogeneity is often overlooked by federated optimization algorithms um, that focus more on data heterogeneity. However, uh, it can cause some serious convergence issues as will show uh, in a toy example. So now let's again consider a toy example where you have just two clients. Uh, in the homogeneous setting, which we were looking at so far, uh, these two clients will do the same number of local updates. So starting from the global model, uh, if you have these as the local minima at the two clients, this is the global minimum. Then starting from the global model, each client will do tau local updates and then 
their updated models will be averaged. So if we choose small enough uh, learning rate or small enough number of local steps, then we can ensure that the global model will eventually converge to a stationary point of the global objective function. However, now instead if, uh, let's say client one does many local steps, whereas client two just does one local steps in every round, uh, and if we just naively average their updates, which is what Fred averaging does. So it will average these updated models in proportion of the uh, local data set sizes. If we do that, then the averaged global model is biased towards uh, the first client's local minimum, as you can see in this picture. And this kind of bias is consistent across communication rounds. And it cannot be easily fixed by techniques that are used to tackle data heterogeneity. So for example, if we try to add some uh, proximal term to limit local drift, it may reduce this problem to some extent, but it won't completely fix it. So in our work, uh, which we call FedNova, uh, we address this problem by first trying to understand what exactly this heterogeneous setting is doing. Like, is it actually optimizing the right objective function or is it optimizing some other objective function? And we found that the homogeneous setting, uh, if we do Fed averaging here, then we are actually optimizing the true objective function. But in this heterogeneous setting, the objective function that we end up optimizing is this f tilde, which does not match with the true objective f of x. In fact, uh, the, the only difference is that it weighs these different local objectives in a different way. So um, the client which gets a higher weight is the one that does more local updates. And because it the, the main problem here is the weights assigned to the different uh, local objectives. The solution uh, is also uh, to fix the aggregation weights. So by doing this analysis, we got the insight that uh, if we fix the aggregation weights in an appropriate way, then we can ensure that we are uh, converging to a stationary point of the correct objective. So let me briefly tell you about this generalized algorithm. So this is uh, the original Fed averaging update rule. So instead of just analyzing this, we analyzed a generalized version of this, which subsumes the original rule as well as some other um, variants of it. So the generalization is done in two ways. Uh, the first generalization is that typically the local updates that are used here, delta i's, are just the sum of the local uh, gradients that, uh, gradient steps that each client takes. So delta i is just this, but instead we make this a linear combination of the local gradients by introducing these parameters ai, which weigh uh, different gradient steps differently. And the benefit of this is that as we change AI, uh, we can control the local optimizer. So by setting AIs in this way, uh, this update rule becomes equivalent to the Fed prox algorithm. By setting AIs in this way, uh, the update rule becomes equivalent to doing local momentum SGD. So this is the first generalization. The second generalization is that uh, the central server, instead of just taking an average of these delta i's, uh, we consider that it will take an average of normalized versions of it. So we'll take the delta i's uh, that, that we defined earlier, we'll normalize them by the L1 norm of these AI vectors, and then take an average of these normalized gradients. And also, uh, instead of PIs, we allow these aggregation weights to be some arbitrary WIs. So this generalized version of the Fed averaging algorithm has three key components, the normalized gradient, uh, which is the local gradients divided by the number of local steps. 
uh, and this is determined by the choice of the client optimizer as well as the number of local updates. Uh, then we have the aggregation rates which control how we are, uh, in what proportion we are averaging these normalized gradients. And then there is the effective steps per round, which you can think of just as a global learning rate to scale this um, purple arrow up and down. And then, as I mentioned before, there are several special cases of this. Uh, one such special case is the regular Fed averaging algorithm. So what's the benefit of uh, this general algorithm and its analysis? Uh, the benefit is that it immediately suggests the solution to our problem of objective inconsistency. So the simple solution is that all we have to do is set these WI weights to PI uh, in order for the surrogate objective function to match with the true global objective. So algorithmically, the way we do that is instead of the regular Fed averaging update rule, which was this, uh, where we average the local changes in the model, that is, we average these delta i's. What we will do in the corrected algorithm, which is FedNova, is that we will take these local, uh, uh, these accumulated local steps delta i, and then divide them by the number of local steps to get these green color normalized updates and then average these normalized updates instead. And by simply doing that, we ensure that we are optimizing the correct uh, surrogate objective and hence we converge to the stationary point of the correct objective. So let me show you some uh, quick results. Uh, so this is a comparison of the proposed Fed Nova algorithm with Fed averaging and Fed prox, which is another um, algorithm that is used in implementations. And you can see that by correcting these aggregation weights, Fed Nova uh, does much better in terms of the training loss. Uh, and it is also very flexible in terms of the local optimizers. So because all it's doing is correcting the aggregation weights, it can be used uh, in conjunction with any local optimizer like vanilla SGD or momentum SGD, proximal uh, local updates or even variance reduction methods. And uh, by correcting the aggregation weights, we get almost uh, eight to 10% test accuracy improvement uh, from just naive aggregation to this aggregation. Um, so finally, uh, let me talk a little bit about adaptive local optimizer. So here I was showing local optimizers such as uh, momentum, process, GD, et cetera. So these actually can be subsumed within the uh, generalized Fed averaging framework that I showed a couple of slides ago. But uh, often um, people use adaptive optimizers like Adagrad or Adam that give faster convergence to the local optimus. Currently, in the context of federated averaging, these are not used at the client level. They are only proposed at the server side. And one of the reasons is that if you use them at clients, then the amount of local progress will be heterogeneous across the clients because these adaptive methods, they depend on estimates of local Hessians. Um, and because of this heterogeneous local progress, you end up with the in objective inconsistency problem uh, that we showed earlier uh, when we had different numbers of local updates. So can we fix um, this heterogeneity uh, even for adaptive optimizers? Uh, so it turns out we cannot directly use FedNova. We have to improve it in uh, slightly generalize it because the current framework does not subsume adaptive optimizers. Um, and we can do that. Uh, I'll not talk about that work here, but I'll add a link there uh, at the end of the talk um, in case somebody is interested. So this is a generalized version of FedNova that can also take into account adaptive optimizers. And if we do that, then we get... Uh, much better convergence than Fed averaging. So in this picture, we are showing 
Fed averaging, which is in blue. Uh, then the uncorrected version of doing local adaptivity, which is shown in green. So you can see that although it converges fast at the beginning, uh, it will have a higher error float. But if we correct it, then we can get this red color curve, which is faster and also reaches a lower error flow. So with that, let me wrap up. Um, in this talk, I talked about different sources of heterogeneity in federated learning and how to tackle them. And the main takeaway is that we don't want to force uh, the system to be homogeneous. We want to allow heterogeneity to make it scalable and flexible and instead design uh, algorithms that try to cope with this heterogeneity while ensuring fast convergence. Uh, there are several other interesting directions that are broadly related to uh, today's talk. Uh, so these directions at a high level, they modify this global objective in different ways. So one of the directions is to allow models to be heterogeneous across the different lines. So instead of this parameter vector x being of the same length, they can, they, it can be of different lengths at different clients. Uh, we can also consider things like concept drift, where the data sets at the clients are not static, but they may change over time. And then the algorithms need to take that into account. Uh, we could consider personalized federated learning, where our goal is not to just train a single model, but rather a set of models that are personalized to each client. And uh, finally, uh, we can also consider incentives. So uh, an underlying assumption in the federated averaging framework is that all the clients will agree to participate. But if the global model does not work well for them, they may choose to leave the framework. So how do you deal with that by modifying this objective? That's another interesting direction uh, that we have some initial results on here. So with that, let me stop and uh, take questions. Thank you for your attention. Uh, here are uh, the links to some of the papers that I mentioned today. Uh, and I'll pause here. Thanks. Thank you, Gary, for a very interesting talk. Um, to the audience, please uh, please type your questions in the Q&A. Maybe we can wait a couple of minutes while they're coming in. I have a question. Can I start? Yes, please. Uh, it was a very nice talk. Gauri's covered a lot of ground and gave an excellent overview. Um, so I was going to ask a question, and he sort of brought it up in this ongoing and future direction slide. So I guess when you have heterogeneous data, I was going to ask, why does this objective make sense in the sense that uh, I have my own data, you have your own data, we might have some our data might be related in some manner, but but the model that we want to learn might be slightly different, right? So so by doing federated learning with the summation i p i f i x, you are mm -hmm. not getting a model that's good for either you or me. So the question: What do you do in a situation like that? So so I uh, I've heard some things like mammal or things like that. Is that what uh, you mean by this personalized federated learning, or is it is it something else? Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good question. So uh, there are several ways of answering it. So maybe let me first answer it in the context of this cross device federated learning where you have these thousands of clients and then a single server. Uh, so personalized federated learning algorithms would allow uh, the clients to have different models. But then they still benefit from collaborating with each other. So if you consider one extreme where these clients just train the models in isolation, then that may not be good either because the amount of local data is limited. The other extreme is what we were showing here in the talk where you just have a single global model. But ideally, we want to be somewhere in between on that spectrum between isolated training and global model training. And one of the ways which is pretty uh, good in practice is just to take the global model and then run a few local steps of fine tuning mm -hmm. and get personalized models. So that is what uh, is based on the mammal idea. Mm -hmm. 
and many practical implementations use it, but that's not the only approach. There are many other approaches to personalize federated learning that are proposed. So, so from a technical perspective, so to for something like that to work, do you make some assumption about the closeness of the distributions that each person has? Otherwise, I mean, I guess what I don't understand is we don't put any constraint on what my data distribution is and your data distribution is, then a common model that I get from federated learning is not going to be useful. So, so is, uh, uh, mathematically, yeah. just trying to understand what would you, how would you sort of post this problem in a way that sort of- Yeah, inherently, it? like there has to be some limit on the heterogeneity. Like if, if, it, if the local distribution is completely different, then the, it won't work very well, it, even with this fine tuning. So the correct question to ask would be, uh, what would be my generalization error if I just use my data versus you just used your data versus we come up with a common initial, uh, uh, right, model, right. come up a uh, common initial model and then sort of do a few more steps whether our generalization error improves. That's a, is that the kind of question people ask or? Yeah, no. yeah, that's the kind of question. However, like generalization questions are pretty hard to answer in this setting. So there's only a limited set of work on it. Uh, yeah. Uh, one more thing I want to mention is that a benefit of having a single global model is that um, the clients can come and go in this framework. So you may have new clients that enter into the system and existing clients that leave. So when a new client enters the system, um, they don't have a personalized model. They don't have a global model even. So uh -huh. it's good to have a global model there that they can begin with and maybe later they can fine tune or personalize it in different ways. So that's another yes. benefit. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Gary. We have a um, we have two more questions. I don't know if you can stay a little bit a little bit longer. Yeah, sure. I'm I'm happy to stay. Right. So um, I actually want to start with the second question here. Uh, so Aniruda asks, um, thank you so much for the informative talk. So federated learning increases the element of privacy and security as it shares model updates and share the raw data. Um, however, would constantly communicating model updates throughout the training process reveal or leak some of those information regarding the privacy and security? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so uh, that's why I didn't say that it guarantees privacy because it does not. Like if you share model updates, then indeed uh, there is uh, a possibility that somebody can reverse engineer and figure out the data by just looking at the model updates. Uh, however, it is still better than sending raw data because if you send raw data and then store it at the cloud, um, then somebody who attacks the cloud system can just directly get access to the data. So the privacy is improved a little is bit. Some kind of rigorous, and that's just... why there is like on a lot of ongoing work on improving the privacy of federated averaging by adding uh, noise using differential privacy or by doing things like secure aggregation. So all of that is indeed necessary on top of the vanilla algorithms. I see. Okay, we have one last question. So Chen Mei asked, thanks for the great talk. I am interested in knowing more about the metric used to quantify fairness in the proposed setting. Ah, okay. So the question is about how to quantify fairness, right? Right. Um, so fairness uh, in this context would mean that, let's say one of these clients has very little data then in this global objective function that I showed, um, that client will have a very low weight and then its updates would not be represented enough in the global objective function. So in order to be fair to clients like this, um, we need to somehow modify the global objective function, maybe by modifying the PI weights that are given to the different clients, either statically or dynamically during training. So that's one way in which uh, you can make it more fair to all the clients. Okay. So this is a different notion of fairness than uh, other 
notions of fairness in machine learning, which is more like in terms of data and different features of the data. So here the fairness is between different clients. I see. Okay. Um, very interesting. So I think that's all the question that the audience had. So thanks very much again, Gary, for a very interesting talk. Uh, thank you to the audience for, for attending, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.